2 Corinthians chapter 6. I have verses 17 and 18 on the screen, but I want you to open your Bible up because I'm going to back up a little bit. Appreciate you coming this morning. Um, next, the year 2020 is going to be uh, an interesting year. Alicia is going to have a baby. Courtney is going to have a baby. Jennifer is going to have a baby. Who else? Who wants to have a baby in 2020? Everett, no, Everett, don't, you know. Amen. Well, it ought to be a good year, amen. Uh, huh? Yeah. Second Corinthians 6. Uh, I'm going to go back to verse 14. This, I started this last Sunday, and I, I'm calling this, it, it's supposed to be a, a teaching, more of a teaching than preaching anything, but a teaching on raising children. There's the world's way, there's a way, and there's God's way. And um, when, I, when God sort of laid this on my heart to preach it, um, you know, our nature is, well, I'll just use myself as an example, and... and God reminded me, Mike, you didn't do everything right, so please don't use yourself as the example, because you'd have to lie, and I didn't want to lie. So I decided it would be called How God is Raising Me, and this is how God has dealt with me, how God has loved me, how God has corrected me, how God has done a lot of, so God is the perfect father. And there's different kinds of people in the world. Some people in this world had a good father figure in their life. Sadly, though, and there may be some listening to me today that never had a decent father in their life. What I can say to you is, I'm not going to change the Bible because of that. What I'm going to tell you is, you can, for the first time in your life, have the best father in the world. And that is God. He is called the father for a reason. He's not just the father of Jesus Christ. He is the father of all of those whom he has conceived and are born again. Amen? And that's part of where I'm going to take this eventually. But so you just kind of listen along. And again, it's not it's not me looking down my nose at anybody. Obviously, I see children nowadays. You see them at the store. You see them at the doctor's office that you would rather not have met. Some children and the things that they are allowed to get by with. And you can tell very quickly who runs that house. It's that four-year-old little brat running around that needs to have a rod taken to him. That's not being mean. That's not child abuse. God designed it. Now, I'm going to get into that probably a little bit later on, but probably not today. But that is God's way. I, I remember Reg Kelly telling me one time he preached on child raising, child rearing, they call it. And he preached out of the Bible, out of the book of Proverbs. And... Um, he had a woman just chew him out on the way out of service that morning. And uh, she said, I don't care what you preach. That, that's child abuse. That ain't wrong. And she just tore him to them. And he said, ma'am, I just quoted to you the word of God. Well, I don't care. And, of course, that was probably the last time she ever went to hear Reg Kelly preach. But, uh, sadly to say, we have been flooded in this country with all sorts of wrong ideas on raising what they used to call hellions and I think the implication is that these are little devils okay and let me just say this very quickly your child is not an angel wasn't born one okay 
We are born with an evil, sinful nature. And that nature being untamed, unharnessed, and untrained will be very destructive later on in life. Very destructive. And I think we're seeing just how destructive when you have children going into school murdering multitudes of other children in a school. I think we're seeing just how rotten children can be with no correction. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. This is our Father telling us, as His children, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. This is a Father telling His, telling his sons and His daughters, I raised you in church, I taught you the Bible. If you're going to marry somebody, marry somebody that's a Christian. Don't marry somebody that's not. I was taught that. By the grace of God, I met my wife in church. In this church. So we ended up, we believed the same thing. Imagine that. Uh, I had a girlfriend at one time in high school. She's a cute little thing. And we went out on a few dates and we'd sit at home on the telephone. You remember the telephone? And we'd kind of call each other every night. Well, I called her one night and she said, you know, I was talking to my pastor about you and he said, you're not saved. Why is that? Because you go to the Free Will Baptist Church. Well, excuse me. And we got into a doctrinal argument that night. And that was the end of that relationship right then and there. Because I was already planning on going to Bible college. And I'm going, you're not going to tell me I'm not saved. So that didn't last long. So, it, I mean, it matters. Amen. It matters. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And the answer is none. What communion hath light with darkness? The answer is none. What concord or agreement hath Christ with Belial? Belial, Satan. And the answer is none. What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? An infidel is someone who doesn't believe. Infidel means unfaithful. Infidel, if you are unfaithful, you will be unfaithful. Think about that. What agreement, verse 16, at the temple of God with idols? So can a Baptist girl marry a Catholic boy? Are they going to go worship idols or not? Uh, stuff like that used to be preached and it's not preached anymore. It's not taught anymore. Um, what agreement at the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And verse 18, I and will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So I want you to think of God being your father. This is how God has conceived you, how God is going to raise you up, how God is going to rear you, how God is going to teach you, uh, how God is going to nurture you. This And this is a lesson to all of us, and you can make many applications of this. If you are in a management position, this is how you can, you are sort of a father or a mother to those that are under you. You have authority over them. There's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. You follow the Bible, God will bless it. God bless Joseph. Amen. Everything got Joseph was the didn't have didn't have nothing to his own, didn't have anything to his name, but he ruled Potiphar's house and God blessed him. God blessed Potiphar because of Joseph, because Joseph did things God's way. And he blessed Joseph while he was under Pharaoh because Joseph did everything God's way and God will bless you as well. But then I want you to take this to heart. Those of you who have, those of you who have children and are raising children, there are great lessons to learn here. And I'm going to hit on some things right off the bat this morning 
that uh, is going to make us think about some things. All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, pray dear God that you would help me this morning. And again, Lord, I am probably not the best qualified uh, to be teaching these lessons. Uh, so I can't teach them as an authority on the subject when I myself um, didn't do what you told me to do right. I did some things wrong. I, I didn't follow your word in raising my children. And Lord, even to this day, now that they're mostly grown up, I still don't always do the right thing by them. So Father, I'm going to appeal to you. And Lord, there are some days I don't feel good, but today I feel fine, but it seems like my tongue is tied this morning. And, and that's usually a sign to me that I really need to lean on you this morning. They need to hear from you today, Father, or not me. And I would just rather have it that way. So, Father, if they're blessed, then they're blessed because of you. And if they didn't like something that was said, then it'll be on you. And they just don't like you. And I pray, dear God, that that wouldn't happen. And pray, dear God, that you would just come down and teach us. You're the preacher. You're the teacher. You're the guide. That you'd open our eyes and help us see some things. Blessed, Father, even in today's world where grandparents are raising grandchildren. Help us, dear God, in the world that these kids are growing up in may be different than the world we raised our children in. And it's a terrible world. And we really need a lot of wisdom. So pray, dear God, that you'd bless us in all ways, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, so, um, I just touched on this last Sunday morning, but this was where I was going to uh, head this morning. Um, let me back up a little bit. The idea that we are conceived by God. If you would take your Bible, turn to First Peter uh, chapter one. Boy, I ain't kidding you. My tongue is tied today. First Peter chapter one, verse twenty-three gives us that idea. When God says, "I'm your father," that's not just some mythological paraphrase. Uh, meta metaphor that doesn't really mean what it says. It means exactly what it says. God has conceived us. For those who understand the conception process, the idea is basically the same. The seed, in this case, is the Word of God. So 1 Peter 1, 23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, I was conceived by Milton Don and Judy A. Hoggard, but that was corruptible seed because my mom and dad were sinners. You should have known them when I was conceived. I can tell you they were sinners, but they were sinners. I was born in corruption, conceived in iniquity. But God, who has conceived my second birth, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So... It could very well be said, I am my father's son because I have been conceived by God by his word, which means that the DNA test is this book. This is the DNA of who I am right now. This is the DNA of this church. This is how we are identified. And we know what DNA is, even over in Kenya. And I preached this in Kenya. They knew what DNA was. I said, you know what DNA is? And he said, yeah, that's how we figure out who the daddy is. I said, sounds like America. Had the same problem over there. So they know that a child is identified by the DNA. We are identified by in our second birth by this book that you and I have called the Word of God. That that thing I had up on the screen a while ago, that man that I hope to, I ain't kidding you, I want to meet this man, Simon Harwood. He's born of the same DNA that I was born of. He's my brother. Amen. Same daddy, same mother. He's my brother, and I'm going to get to see him one of these days. 
And all of those saints who have gone on before, they are conceived of the same God, the same Father, the same, same book, same word. Now, last Sunday I mentioned this, conceived in perfection. And that was what I put up on the screen. First Peter chapter 1 verse 23, being born again of incorruptible seed by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. My first birth is temporary. My second birth is everlasting. Amen. Now, conceived by God in love. And let me, I'm going to read some verses to you. Then I'm going to explain what I mean by this. John chapter 1 verse 12. But as many as received him. You can turn there if you want. John chapter 1 verse 12. But as many as received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God. Literally it means exactly what it says. Even to them that believe on his name. Which were born. Not of blood. Nor of the will of the flesh. Nor of the will of man. And let me explain that. I didn't choose my parents. I didn't choose my parents. I didn't whisper to God in some bubble world where he keeps all the souls. Yeah, I've seen Don and Judy. I like them. Can I have them? It would have been more like yeah, I like this couple over here. And God would say, no, nah, you're not good enough for that. I'm going to give you to Don and Judy. How's that? So he gave me to them. But I didn't get to pick my parents. They picked me. God picked us. See, you were conceived in love. My dad really did love my mom. She told me, I'm probably going to get this wrong. But when my daddy first met my mama, I mean, he just fell hot wheels in love with her. And snuck over to her house and, or as he was leaving her house one night, he wrote, he took his finger and wrote, I love you on the windshield of the car. Knowing that the next morning, when the frost hit the car, it would show up. So the next morning, my mom gets up and looks out in the car, and my daddy had written, I love you, and it was still on the car the next morning. Okay? He loved her. He married her. He stayed with her. They had difficulties like every other married couple, but they loved each other. They loved their daughter. They loved me. They even picked Trish. She was the one picked better than Lisa, Melissa and I was. Okay? But they loved each other. And they were not upset when I was born. Are you getting my point here? It's not a father... Who can conceive a child. Any guy. Can conceive a child. And what we have in this country. And I'll limit it to the state of Missouri. County of Jefferson. What we have in this county. Is too many children conceived. Who were not loved to begin with. That child will suffer until they meet God. They will suffer for that. Amen? So, and I want everybody, I want everybody, I want young people hearing this. Here's what we were told growing up here. You don't date anybody that you would not marry. And you don't crawl in a bed with somebody who you are not married to. Can I still preach that here? Well, that's old timey. No, that's what God said. God calls it fornication. Okay? And this is a huge, very serious issue that we have in, 
I'll, I'll, all over the world, but I'll limit it to just our area, is that too many children are conceived out of wedlock. At least in wedlock, there is the hope that the promises will be kept. But they are conceived out of wedlock, conceived by men and women who had absolutely no intention of conceiving a child. They were just there for the thrill of the romance. And so modern America's solution to that problem, kill the child. Kill the child. Mom and dad sinned. The adults sinned, or the teenagers sinned. So carry it out on the child. It wasn't the child's fault. So that's the first problem that we have. Children that are conceived that are not loved. So this is why people, godly people, go to abortion mills and beg and plead with these women from across the street. So now the government made that illegal. You can't get within so many hundred feet of an abortion mill because the abortionists don't want that mother to change her mind going in there. They want that money. That's what that's about, by the way. That's big money. The lady who ran Planned Parenthood doesn't spill the beans on that one. When she admitted to that guy, she didn't know he was undercover. She admitted to that guy or that gal that yes, they were selling the parts for research. That's wicked. Listen, we got to get God back in this country. Amen. But that's my point. A child conceived by parents who at least love each other, that child's got a chance to be loved by those parents. Now I'm going to throw this in on top of it. If you conceive children and you did the right thing, you're married, stay married, stay home. Dads, don't belong at a pool hall all hours of the night while mom's at home with the children. Mom and dad don't belong at the dance hall all hours of the night, every day of the week, while God knows who is watching those children. Oh, I like that kind of preaching. We've lost, listen, we've lost our way in the country. There was a time when these things didn't even have to be said. But now because they weren't said, people just did whatever they wanted to, and we have serious problems in this country. Serious problems with children who are not loved. And I can't think of anything worse in this world than to be an unloved child. Children need somebody to love them or they'll never, they'll never be right. 1 John 3, 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth this, us not, because it knew him not. See, this is why you don't like already some of the things I'm saying. When you don't know God and understand his ways, then you don't like some of the things this Bible teaches. It is foreign to you and you don't like it. You've already accepted that things are okay in this world and they're not okay. 
Let me just let me make this simple. This, this is the way it's supposed to be. Boy loves girl. And I said, boy loves girl. Okay? And this way it's supposed to be. This is the way God made it in the Garden of Eden. Adam loved Eve. When he saw her, he loved her. He said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife. And they too shall be one flesh. Notice he said cleave to his wife. Not cleave to his harlot. Not cleave to his mistress. Not cleave to his Playboy magazine. But cleave to his wife. Those are the exact words of the Bible. Jesus even blessed that. So did Paul. And he said it's a picture of Christ and his church. So a lot of things have been lost out of our thinking process in this country, in the United States of America, in the state of Missouri, in the county of Jefferson. A lot of things are missing from people's thinkings because they have forgotten the old way, the way people used to live. And they thought, well, that's just the old-fashioned way. No, it was God's way. It's what God set forth to fulfill His will on this earth. And man has forsaken it. But children, I'll get back to this. Children, oh, let me get back to this. Boy loves girl. Girl loves boy. Boy and girl get married. Then, boy and girl have a baby. Now, are you preaching condemnation, Mike? I'm preaching God can forgive anything. And He does all the time. But we have to realize what we did was wrong. What we did was not God's best way and this is what i'm trying to convey i'm not really not trying to condemn anybody i'm trying to show you god has a way for us to live and it's very simple stuff it's stuff that our grandfathers and our grandmothers knew it's what brought us into this world and it's very simple ideas god ordained marriage and the marital bed to be a sacred thing separate from everything else and no other way is allowed. That's by God's Ten Commandments. No other way is allowed. And at least then, children, hopefully, but it's not guaranteed, but at least then, children will hopefully have an honest chance of being loved by somebody in this world. You guys, I mean, you know what went through my heart when we found those four children in Kenya. I have never met these kids and probably never will. But I wept over them. Because they, their daddy was dead. Mom died of a drug overdose. They have not even found her body yet. Probably has been eaten by animals. And they were on their own and nobody loved them. Until God sent Mike there and he just happened to walk their way. And you should have seen Michael's face. He couldn't get over it. He came begging me, can I please go back to Kenya? He was crying. So that's what I'm talking about. Children being loved. Instead of being in the way, children ought to be loved. Somebody say amen. Romans 5, turn there. Boy, I like this. Romans 5, verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet, peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth His love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, you know, pre i got to preach justice. I got to preach, this is God's rules, and if you break them, you're wrong. I have to preach that. But I also preach that, yes, even though you've done wrong, God still loves you. 
And God would love to bring you into His family to call you His very own child. God would love to do that. That's why Christ died. Christ didn't just die for the good people. Christ did not just die for members of Bethel Church. Christ died for the whole world. Because He loved sinners. So everybody in God's eyes has a chance. Of being loved by God and being called into his family to be born again. Now, John 3.16. Turn there. Turn John John 3.16. Come on. Now watch this. Even your brother loves you. Melissa. Trish. John 3.16. For God so loved the world... That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, we're conceived in love. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, was Christ an unwilling participant in this? No. He loved the world because his father loved the world. And he said, Daddy, I'll go willingly. You don't have to kick me out of heaven. I'll go willingly because I love them. So think of Christ, our brother by adoption, does not condemn his own brethren. Amen. Now, I have written up here, think Joseph. Not Mary's husband, Joseph. Joseph, who was hated by his own brothers, was going to be killed by his own brothers, Sold into slavery by his own brothers. Forgotten about by his own brothers. Told daddy, daddy a beast killed him, he's dead, forget about him. Thinking they could get in daddy's favor now that the favorite son was gone. Meanwhile, Joseph ends up becoming the second ruler of the entire world under Pharaoh. And when his brothers come back, not knowing it's Joseph... Come back because they're starving to death and they need food. Joseph doesn't even hate them then. But he says, it is I, Joseph, be not afraid. And by the way, I've got plenty of food. He does not condemn even his own brethren. And neither should we. Let me ask this question. Do we want people to be saved who come in this church? So let's don't meet them at the door as they come in, sizing them up. Amen? Well, I don't know if I want them in here. I want them in here. Amen? That's what I mean. When we look at sinners, and I'm as guilty of this as anybody. We look at sinners, that's somebody that Christ died for like he died for me. And he didn't die for me, Ron, while I was good. He died for me when I was not good. Amen? 2 Thessalonians 2. Turn there. 2 Thessalonians 2. Verse 16. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God even our Father which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation. You know what that word means? Consoling. You know what the word console means? When you see somebody down and you go to them and you put your arm around them and say, I love you. What's going on? What can I do for you? That's consolation. That is consoling someone. And that's God, our Father. He's, And I mentioned a while ago, maybe you were not raised in a home with a father figure that loved you. But you have one now. 
if God is your father. And he is a God of consolation. I'm going to say, I, I didn't say a whole lot about Caleb while he was here. By the way, he's up with Matthew and Paige while Lisa's going through her cancer thing. And, um, but when Lisa brought him over, he was about six months old. And she said, isn't he cute? And I knew what she was getting at. And she said, more than likely he'll be up for adoption. And I said, honey, I'll pray about it. Now, God had been dealing with me as her husband. And she knew I wasn't just passing him off by, saying, by using the excuse, I'll pray about it. She knew that wasn't me. I'm saying no, but I'm not going to tell you no right now. She knew I was going to pray about it. And I did. And here's what I prayed. God... I know what it takes to be a father because you've given me four children already. And I know when those kids don't do right, Sparky, Alicia, Lindsay, Matthew, if they don't do right and I get ticked off at them and I have to give them a whipping. But I restrain myself because I love them. I have the restraint of a loving father. And I said to God, God, I know I would do this because my wife wants this. And I want to do this for my wife. You've been dealing with me about being a husband, giving myself over to my wife and doing, and doing things for my wife and giving her what she's asking me and all kinds of things. But God, this is different because if I don't love him like he's my son, I won't be nice to him. I'll be mean to him. And that's true. Because how many children are being quote unquote raised by a live in boyfriend? And how does that work? Not too well. Those boyfriends didn't move in because of those kids. And how many cases do we end up seeing on the news where the children were beat or killed by the live-in boyfriend so I had enough just enough wisdom in me to know that if I didn't love him like he was my son I wouldn't treat him right and I said God if you want me to take him in I'll do it but only if you make me love him like he's my flesh and blood. And two weeks later, God did that. And I fought for that boy. And I mean, I fought hard. He's different than our other children. I'm glad now that I asked God to make me love him. Because he was a little bit higher maintenance. And if I hadn't loved him, it wouldn't have gone well. So I want you to understand. When you have children that you actually love, you will do anything in the world for those children. Will you not? But when it comes time to correct them, you will use loving restraint on yourself to do it right. There is a right way to whip children and a wrong way to do it. And if you've ever done it the wrong way, shame on you. Shame on you. You don't hit a child unless you love them. Amen? That's what I'm talking about. Our Father which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. 
And I'll get back to this. If you were not raised in a home with a loving father, I'm telling you, you have one available now that's better than even a human father who loved you would have been. Comfort your hearts. Comfort your hearts. And establish you in every good word and work. Just like, just like a father. Just like my dad took me out, taught me how to change a tire. Took me out, taught me how to split wood, how to shoot a squirrel, how to kill a deer. How to change the oil in the car. Mom taking me, showing me how to do laundry. That didn't take, but at least she tried to show me. But that's what that means. Establish you in every good word and work. You see, listen to me now. Parents who raise children establish you in every good word. You can't show love while all you do is yell and scream at your children. That's not love. And it's certainly not discipline. Now, I'm not against raising your voice to a child because something's got to get their attention. And the girls will bring the kids, their kids to me and say, Papa, you need to say something to them. And I'll say, if you don't stop it right now, I'll whip you myself. Boy, they look at me with silver dollar eyes like that. But you're Papa. But that's all I got to do, right? That's all I got to do. And I'm never going to whip my grandkids. But don't tell them that. But that's all I got to do. So there's nothing wrong with it in context and in love. But if all you do is yell and scream at a child, why don't you give them good words like a mom is supposed to do to her children? Or a dad. My dad would tell me, son, I love you. Wasn't easy for him to say he come from a different time, but he said it. So that's what good fathers do. They establish. You know what the word establish means? Stabilize them. Children need to grow up in a stable environment. Not with the threat of, is daddy leaving? Is mom and dad fighting again? Is daddy going to hit mama again? They should never be brought up in that. Never! But stabilize them. Establish them, fathers, with good words and good works. You know what that means? If I ever catch you kids smoking, I'm going to whip the daylights out of you. You hear me? Establish them in good word and good work. I get off of that. Ephesians 2, turn there. This is a made up picture. That is a pole picture. Those are not brothers and sisters. I can tell you that right now. Because you should have rode down to Jacksonville, Arkansas, from Festus, Missouri, with my mom and dad and my sister and I. Six-hour trip. And if so much of a molecule of me touched my sister, she would say, Mom! Tell him to stop touching me. Get away from me. Get over on your other side. Don't sit back there and shake your head no. I'm telling mom right after church. I'm calling mom. <laughs> Ephesians 2. I'm the preacher here. I get to say it's my way. <laughs> Ephesians 2. Ha! 
He said they used to put pictures up, help her being kidnapped in the car as they're going down the road. That's all right. I asked my mom, Mom, tell me the truth. Was I adopted? And she said, yeah, but they gave you back. <laughs> <laughs> Ephesians 2, verse 4. But God... By the way, if you accept God as your Father, He's rich! That's like, who was it? Different strokes getting adopted by Mr. Drummond. You remember that? Them boys had it made, amen? But God, hey, my father's rich in something besides money. My father is rich in mercy. Dads, dads, listen to me. Don't you ever forget to forgive your children. God who is rich in mercy... For his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. Christ is our brother. And, he's, and as God brought Christ back from the dead, he brings us back from the dead, and now we are with Christ. And hath raised us up together. You see that phrase? Raised us up. God is raising me right now as His child because I don't know how to do everything right yet. But I'm learning. And for those who you, you're, you're not sure you want to be saved because you think, I can't do everything right yet and I won't, I won't live right and I won't do right, you let God worry about that. Amen, God's people? You let God, have, didn't you let God worry about that? And has not God made a difference in your life since you got saved? Tell, somebody tell, say amen. amen. This is how it works. We don't accept people who can show us a letter of good merit into being saved. It's the sinners that God will teach them how to live right. Over time, God will teach them how to do that. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that those of us who have the same Father love the brotherhood. Because we all have the same Father. Amen? Amen. I guess I ought to quit. I got one more. <laughs> Psalm 103, and then I'll be done. Turn there. Like Psalm 103, give you about three seconds, four, five, six, seven seconds. You look at this Bible verse. You look at this verse. There's great wisdom. I hate that this is the end of the message, but this is really the climax of it. And I want you to listen. I want you to really pay attention to this. Okay, so give me a few more minutes, please. Psalm 103, verse 13. Like as a father pitieth his children. Isn't that the truth? Those of us who have children, when they were children, when they were little, we pitied them, we loved them. Decent fathers don't, Burn their children with cigarettes because they didn't tie their shoes right. They pitied their children. So the Lord pitieth them that fear Him. For He knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. Dads, moms, don't forget that you were a child too. My son Matthew, uh, when he graduated, he thought he wanted to be a carpenter. He took carpentry in college. And he joined, a, he got a job working for a big carpenter outfit. And a guy told me, he said, depending on what crew he gets in, he may get in a crew that's not going to treat him well. I said, really? He said, yeah, because there's a lot of guys in a lot of these crews that think they're God's gift to carpentry and they forget that these young guys coming up don't know anything. They forgot that they were a young guy coming up, didn't know anything. 
And sure enough, Matthew got in with a group of guys that treated him like trash. They called him names, because my son has Tourette's, Matthew has Tourette's, and he would make little noises every now and then, and they abused him for that, they treated him bad for that, they called him names, they gave him all the grunt jobs, he would come home crying every day, Daddy, I can't do this. Son, just pit, work it out, and, you know, trying to get him to grow up a little bit, but finally he just, he said, I can't do it. And I don't blame him. So, let this be a lesson to those who are managers or you have young guys coming in or young girls coming in who need to be trained. You can't think that they know what you know after you've been doing it 30 years. You idiot. Amen? You can't think that they're supposed to be as good as you are. Teach them. Teach them. He knoweth our frame and he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone. And the place thereof shall know it no more. Listen to me. They're only young for a little while. That's what that's saying to you. They're like dust. They're like grass. It's green, and then it's gone. They're only young for a little while, and then you don't have them no more. And you know what we do as old people? We sit and look back on the days that maybe we should have spent a little bit more time with them. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear Him and His righteousness unto His children's children. Now listen to me. I'm going to let you go on this one. For those of you who are afraid to come to God, let me tell you who God really is. God is the one who who knows that we sin. God is the one who knows that He made us weak and that our frame is small and that we're of no substance. God is the one who remembers to pity us because He knows we're human. And if He's willing to take us in to be His children, it must mean He really loves us. So, I want you to bow your head for a minute. Now, I know I've said a lot of strong things here. Maybe you weren't ready for that. But I want to say this to you. The God that I know now I know to be a merciful God. God is a just God. And if you live your entire life in sin without calling upon Him for salvation, you will be judged and you will be cast into the lake of fire. However, you don't have to be. And I promise you, if you are willing to call upon God to be your everlasting Father, I promise you, He will be the most merciful, patient, understanding, kind, gentlest Father you have ever had. He will be the father that your daddy wishes he was like. That's who you'll find in, in God. So, you call upon the name of the Lord. I promise you, you'll find him to be merciful. Father in heaven, we come before you today. And I know there was some hard things said. They had to be said. We have greatly lost our way in this country. It used to be common for moms and dads to be married, children to be raised by those parents, brought up at least 
fearing the Ten Commandments. And we have gotten so far away from that now. So, Father, we pray, God, that you would help us to understand that you really are God full of mercy to those who want mercy. But to those who want to continue in sin, you will have no choice but to enact justice upon them at the end of their life. And they will have to be in fear of their death every day they're alive. But Father, it doesn't have to be that way. You are a merciful God. I have found that out. And Father, you have never failed me as a son, though I have failed you. And I pray, dear God, that you would help somebody, Lord, today to reach out to you to call upon you, saying, God, will you be my father? Because I want to be your son. Father, bless us and help us, dear God. Take the lessons that we've learned. Use it to enrich and better our lives. And Father, if we fail, help us to learn from our mistakes and try again. But help us to learn these lessons. Bless your word as this preached, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, would you stand to your feet? Thank you for coming this morning.